Hi, I'm Michael Grayeyes. I'm championing the post-apocalyptic novel Station Eleven on Canada Reads 2023. I discovered this book, interestingly, after watching um, the miniseries that uh, was based on, on Emily's novel. I remember watching it and thinking to myself, uh, this is simply one of the best miniseries I've seen um, in years. And then of course, uh, you know, I had to post about it. I posted about it on Instagram and immediately my students from York um, were quick to respond. They said, but you have to read the book. The book is incredible. So um, that led me here and that led me to uh, Canada Reads and now delightfully um, connecting with Emily St. John Mandel, the author. Hello, Emily. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for championing my book. And I'm a huge fan of the limited series too. So it's lovely to hear that you encountered it through that. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. One of the things that struck me when I was reading Station Eleven is that the world seemed to be fraying, you know, mm -hmm. in, like in front of our eyes, but we were unaware or or we weren't looking at it as an unraveling. We were just looking at it as, oh, this is the texture of, of the way our modern life works. Mm -hmm. um, but in response, um, you know, like once once I got deeper into the novel and once we started doing the chime jumps, I was like, oh my gosh. The author described our world and then put it in context and said, this world is in many ways unraveling in front of our eyes. And like, we're trying mm -hmm. to hold on to it, but it's just like, it's like, just, we can't hold it together. Um, yeah. What it took was like a little push. And in this case, mm -hmm. it was, you know, a pandemic. And I, I was really moved by that. I, it, it really connected me, not only to this moment, like this specific historical moment that we're in right now, uh, but also grounded for me the beginning of that story. Um, mm -hmm. So what was it um, that initiated your thinking um, to, to, begin, to begin the novel? You know, it's funny. It, it was originally not going to be post-apocalyptic when I first started writing it. I had this idea that I just wanted to write about what it means to devote your life to your art, the costs and the joys of that which was something I thought about a lot, you know, as a writer who always had a day job or two or three, um, the incredible juggling act that it can take to create art in this world, where it's not always particularly valued. So I thought it'll just be about a group of actors and just what it's like to devote your life to that. But at the same time, I do feel a sense of awe at the world that surrounds us. It is, It does often feel like it's unraveling, on the other hand, it is still the age of miracles. I'm in, I'm in New York City. I could get to Europe in about six hours. Um, you know, if I want to make a phone call, I'm just going to take the supercomputer out of my pocket and enter a series of numbers that will result in a signal being beamed to the satellites and back down to, say, British Columbia, where my family lives. Um, if I develop diabetes, I'll be able to get insulin. You know, like these are incredible things that we do take for granted because we can, you know, we kind of, you don't always see the things that you don't have to see or that you don't have to notice. So I had this idea that an interesting way to write about the modern world would be to write about its absence. You know, what does it look like if all of this that we take for granted suddenly falls away? You know, what do we long for and try to recreate in that absence? So that was, that was where I went to next to the book. I was like, okay, I'm going to keep the traveling company of artists, but I'm going to set them in this post-technological landscape. But there's also, there's something else that you just alluded to, which is the incredible fragility of what we think of as civilization. You know, just in the way that when I started researching this book, what quickly became clear to me is that if people stop going to work, the whole world falls apart. You know, if the guy who delivers gasoline to the gas stations doesn't do that tomorrow morning, like it, it, it's done. <laughs> it's like the roads get clogged. You can't go anywhere. Um, 
if aviation fuel doesn't get delivered, then the airplanes are grounded. If people stop showing up to work at power plants, then eventually the power grid fails. Um, you know, same with your internet service provider. It, it's just, and it's just kind of interesting to think about because it's easy to think of this world as incredibly mechanized, you know, like it's all systems and computer and code, but there is this kind of web of people who are keeping all of that running. It's like, you know, there, there's a line in Station Eleven where um, it's Jeevan. Um, he's in he's in an apartment with his brother, and the world's collapsing. And he kind of thinks about how we bemoaned the impersonality of the modern world, but it's all people. You know, it's still all people even now when it feels incredibly mechanistic and cold sometimes. So, yeah, that that was something I was thinking about. And it's kind of moving to me to think about the world in that way. Just, you know, it, it's all people doing their jobs. And that's what prevents chaos. Oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah, I I was I was just taken away almost immediately. I, I remember there was this, it's near the beginning of the book. It's like, and then all the, all the iPads turned off and all the phones turned <laughs> right. off. And then the light, you know, and it just, mm -hmm. you, this incredible list of things that we take for granted. Right. And, yeah. And then we just started thinking about it. it's like, oh, you know, what happens if I get a cut? And that gets yeah, exactly. Yeah. And 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 then there's a cascading effect. Like we're so reliant. Um, I often joke um with my family. I was like, uh, we're the we're the weakest generation, you know. <laughs> we really of, are, yeah. In terms of our ancestors, like mm -hmm. like our ancestors lived outside. Like yeah, exactly. They, Without antibiotics. Yeah, they weathered insane, you know, kinds of conditions. Uh, yeah. Like spring came, it must have felt like an absolute miracle, right? Like some kind of salvation. Like you survived yeah. that winter. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, it's it's funny that 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 occurs. You know, like that mm -hmm. that this might occur to us, like the ones least equipped to figure it out. Yeah. Isn't it troubling to realize how few practical skills you have? Or like, maybe I'm just speaking for myself. Like, you know, if you need a novel written in the post-apocalyptic, uh, you know, come to me. Like, I've got you covered. Um, <laughs> but God, reshoeing a horse or fishing or hunting, like, I'm sorry. Exactly. <laughs> I have no like, idea what I'm doing with these practical what do you skills. do when something goes wrong with a tooth? Like- Yeah, exactly. So- you know this that that world uh, the dystopian world has always um attracted me uh, uh, one book that really struck me when i was a teenager growing up in toronto uh was um the chrysalids i don't know if you know this book um but it's set in uh you know a post apocalyptic north america i remember reading this book and it was just like it blew my mind right because uh in the story um some of the children had uh uh, psychic or telekinetic abilities mm -hmm. and so it was hidden so I've always been drawn to uh, this world of literature you know this for whatever reason science fiction as well you know in terms of dystopian literature how how have you approached that genre or or what's your connection with it um one of the books that influenced me the most in my life was A Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter Miller. It came out in 1960. Isn't it great? I can tell from your face that you've read it too. It, yeah. It's so good. Um, and that's a really different kind of apocalypse than Station Eleven. But it's the book I read that made me think about what the world after the end of the world might be like. And it just stayed with me forever. When I was a teenager, I read a ton of sci-fi, but I feel like it was more sci-fi, like space stations and androids than post-apocalypse. Um, something that bothers me a little bit about the genre is that around the time I started writing Station Eleven, it seemed to me that very often the genre was basically just horror set after the end of the world. And, you know, I, as a real exemplar of that, I would think of um, Cormac McCarthy's novel, The Road, yep. which I love that book. Yep. You know, I, I was obsessed with it. I will never read it again. <laughs> you know, there's some books you just don't need to read twice. <laughs> um, right, right. And this is going to sound like a weird thing to say about a book that I truly loved and admired. But when I was writing Station Eleven, I was very aware of writing The Anti-Road. 
Because mm-hmm. it, it seems to me that that so often post-apocalyptic novels or films or TV series are set in this um, this immediate aftermath after the end of the world, like this period of just absolute mayhem and chaos and horror. And it's not that I don't think that would happen. I think it absolutely would. It's not plausible to me that that would last forever, at least not everywhere on earth, because that's not sustainable. You know, like most people, you know, well, we might be able to imagine ourselves committing desperate acts in a desperate time. I'd like to think that 15 or 20 years out, we would have chilled out a little bit because you know, that's just not sustainable over the long haul. Um, nobody wants to live that way. Right. So, yeah, so that was um, that was a very conscious choice I made in terms of the timeline of Station Eleven, which is that, okay, I assume that there's this awful chaotic period when the world's just ending and people are struggling to survive. But maybe it's more interesting to think, well, but then what's the next world? You know, what does the world look like 15, 20 years later? Maybe there might be some space for a traveling theater company and, you know, a group of musicians. Something I like to emphasize with this book is that it is a hopeful project. You know, Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people will not read a pandemic novel, which I absolutely get after the three years we've just had, (laughs) or, Mm -hmm. you know, they, um, Mm -hmm. or they won't read it because they think it's going to be horror, but it is a hopeful story. And there is a lot of hope in thinking of, yeah, just that idea of like the next world after the horror. Absolutely. It's what drew me to your book. Thank you. I love the road also. Um, but I think a hallmark of that genre is that we grieve what we have lost. Yeah. And it's like, that. it's just, it's, it's an encompassing grief. Like, you know, my family it has died around me. I'm I'm alone. You know, like that seems to be the the hallmark. And I, I think it appeals to us, you know, like in, in the sense of like horror, like how am I going to make it through the next day? There's like roving bands of cannibals, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and what drew me to Station Eleven, why I stayed with it page after page, apart from your gorgeous prose, um, was that it's laden with hope. There's right. There's the next moment, there's the next moment. And I think uh, we as a species um, are wired to hope. Um, mm-hmm. I think we are. Uh, I think that's yeah. why we're still here. Um, mm-hmm. uh, life on earth has not been easy. Uh, we've created a lot of comforts, um, but when it's all gone, I I remember a wedding I went to, it was, it was you know, a very close friend of mine. And uh, we were in Washington and it was the middle of a terrible, terrible rainstorm, like a monsoon where they delayed the wedding for like two hours because it looked like the the tent was about to, you know, crash oh, in wow. on Okay. And then the water went out. I mean, the um, the power went out and they said, we're going to get married. It, you know, the rain's not going to stop. It's going to be, you know, days of this. So they got married and we were, they were, they were married by flashlight, you know, oh, and wow. didn't see lights. It was like, this was the most hopeful wedding I'd ever seen mm-hmm. because even mm-hmm. when the power goes out, even when there's d- disaster, you know, like there's, there's mm-hmm. a bad storm uh, around us, we will hold on to um, uh, things that are important to us, faith, each other, love, um, mm-hmm. and for me, that's, that's what is in page after page of, of your great, great novel. So thank you. Thank you. You know that, I love that story. And that sounds really beautiful, you know, getting married and kind of the rainy dark by candlelight and flashlight. Like that's what an incredible experience. <laughs> There's that recurring line in station 11 that kind of gets to the heart of what we're talking about here. Um, the line that I borrowed from an episode of Star Trek that I saw when I was about 20. Uh, survival is insufficient. And that's why we'll do things like get married in the dark with no lights or, you know, in more extreme circumstances. That's why we'll do things as a species like play musical instruments in refugee camps or, you know, put on plays in war zones. Like all these things that might seem on the surface to be frivolous, but I think are actually the opposite. And you know, to kind of bring this full circle, I think that's what 
my friend Patrick Somerville did really well in the series, you know, just um, showing that kind of hope and like, yeah, just the desire to create art, which for some of us can feel the same thing as the desire to remain human during impossible circumstances. I can't think of a better way um, to conclude than that statement. Um, I'm in complete agreement. Um, <laughs> Wonderful. Em Emily, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, thank you for uh, committing to a life of making art. Well, thank you. It's been such a pleasure talking to you today. And I really appreciate you championing my book. Thank you.